Hey everybody, it's Professor Costa. Um, so we're going to be going over medications affecting postpartum patients and newborns. And I'm sorry about the necessity of an online class, but that's what happens sometimes with our schedule. Okay, so medications for newborns. The two big ones that you'll probably see on your exams and the boards, etc. And when you do your newborn um, your OB rotation and you're with newborns, you'll see this is often done. The um, erythromycin ophthalmic ointment is actually most commonly done in the labor room, though sometimes it's delayed for up to an hour. Vitamin K is done um, within the first 24 hours, and then the hepatitis B vaccination is most commonly um, administered while the newborn and mom are still in the hospital. We try to capture everybody. Um, as soon as possible. So vitamin K is for the prevention of hemorrhage in the newborn. Um, they don't have an intact gut just yet and um, the formation of vitamin K, um, they don't have the ability to do that. So hemorrhage is a huge concern, which is why we administer vitamin K. So you may have patients say, why am I, why does my baby need vitamin K? They don't have the ability to make it yet. They don't have um, a mature um, intestines, and so they get just one shot to cover them while their body is doing all that. Okay. Um, they don't receive enough through the placenta, and they don't have enough intestinal flora. Okay. So it's usually a 0 0.5 to 1 milligram IM in the vastus lateralis or rectus femoris within an hour of birth. Okay. Um, a lot of patients. Um, I like to call them my crunchy granola, but more and more people are reading up on things and they will ask about erythromycin ophthalmic ointment at the time of delivery. So they'll actually say, oh, you know, I really wanted to bond with my baby and if you put that stuff in his or her eyes, then he's not going to be able to see me. Um, it's a law. It's a federal law. We used to have lots of babies in the oldie timey days that would go blind from um, vaginal flora from the mom that they contacted through the birth canal. So it's a federal law. So, you know, you can say, um, I appreciate what well, we can, you know, let you bond for the first hour, but it really needs to be put in their eyes as soon as possible. There are some side effects that you can have, um, such as, you know, some mild edema, um, but that's just, uh, that's, you know, doesn't last very long. It's a mild side effect. It totally beats the possibility that they have chlamydia in their eye or gonorrhea in their eye and they lose their vision, right? Um, and it is, it's a law. So you have to follow the law. They, you know, as much as they may complain and, and it needs to be done. You don't want to let, if there is gonorrhea in the baby's eye, you don't want to let that sit there for very long, okay? Um, all right, so that's done as a half inch ribbon and it's placed into the lower conjunctival sac, and that prevents um, STIs, things like that, chlamydia causing conjunctivitis. Um, and it usually is done within an hour of birth, mandatory, okay. So hepatitis B, when we go over in immunizations, I'm forgetting where this falls in your, um, both sections have slightly different orders. Um, if you haven't had a, uh, immunizations yet, you will. And it's done as the first part of a three-part series, and it's usually done before discharge. We always pick the opposite leg. So how do you know what leg? You look in the medication administration record or the EMAR and they'll say which thigh they um, gave the baby the vitamin K in. Usually there's a Band-Aid too, that's a dead giveaway. If there's a Band-Aid, you pick the other leg. Um, but you can check in the medication administration record to see which leg the baby got the other dose. And we use the opposite leg, okay? Um, again, that is to prevent hemorrhage, so re really important, all right? Um, some things about erythromycin, um, it's a um, petroleum-based uh, product, so it's, you know, like a Vaseline-y type thing, um, so it's kind of goopy, and um, it's not something that you want to leave. Uh, I've seen nurses leave it in the warmer. First of all, it, um, you know, it deactivates the actual medication, um, so you don't want to put it in the warmer. Uh, do you ever want to heat antibiotics ever? No. And two, it's a you know petroleum-based product. So if you leave it in the warmer, it could be too warm. It could actually burn the baby's eyes. So we don't want to leave that in the warmer. If you think it's too chilly, you can leave it at room temperature. But actually, um, I'd rather have cold eye drops than warm ones myself. Um, so again, you're going to put in a half-inch ribbon in each of the infant's eyes. 
mild side effects, uh, some mild redness and edema, and that's not every infant, okay? All right. Okay, so hepatitis B is a preventable illness, so which is why we have vaccines nowadays. So HPV transmission occurs vertically, um, primarily at the time of delivery. So that means that baby gets it during delivery. So if appropriate, um, if mom is uh, HPV positive, we may have to give the baby a dose of hepatitis B immunoglobulin, which is HBIG. So that way the infant doesn't seroconvert. So we're gonna give the baby somebody else's immunity. That's what immunoglobulin is. Somebody else who is immune, we're gonna give the baby um, passive immunity to that. Um, so for instance, infants whose moms are HPV status is unknown. We are also, um, if they're high risk, um, we may also give the infant a dose of HBIG, okay? And then for everybody else, the HPV vaccine, ideally they're getting that vaccinated prior to discharge. Not every infant gets that at before discharge, but working at Women and Infants as I do, I'm gonna tell you about 99% of our babies get vaccinated before they leave because otherwise you don't capture them. Um, but there are some people that are like, absolutely not. I want to wait until I see my pediatrician in the office and discuss that with them. So we do, you know, it's not, um, you know, this isn't Russia. We're not going to make them do things that they don't want to do. And parents do have the ultimate decision with this vaccine. Okay. They don't with the erythromycin. You're going to get the erythromycin. But with H, uh, HPV, they can decide if they want to do that later on. Okay. So here's a quick question. The nurse knows that correct installation of the eye ointment used for newborn eye prophylaxis is, what do we think? Right, so um, we already talked about this, and that's um, in, into the lower conjunctival sac. Okay, so if we put it in the inner canthus of the eye, it's not going to be spread evenly, and the whole point is to prevent conjunctivitis. So, for preventing conjunctivitis, then we want to make it sure that it goes into the lower conjunctival sac. All right. Okay. So, medication goals for postpartum patients. The big one is prevention of uter uterine acne and postpartum hemorrhage. A lot of women still die in the world from postpartum hemorrhage, mostly from uterine acne. So the big problem with patients in America especially is the amount of interventions we do for delivery. So the more that we augment labor with oxytocin, the more likely that those receptor sites are gonna be bogged down after delivery and not do their job. So um, we actually cause a lot of these cases. Other risk factors for uterine acne and postpartum hemorrhage would be someone who's had multiple babies. So, um, you know, it's their sixth or seventh child. Um, the more that uterus has, to, has been stretched out over the years and now it has to shrink back down and squeeze in on itself, the more likely that it's not gonna be able to do a good job. Or women who have multiples. So if they have twins uh, or triplets, then that increases the likelihood that they're going to have uterine acne. Other risks for postpartum hemorrhage, you're gonna go over in your other class, but things including um, infection of the uterus or uh, precipitous delivery. Um, again, the longer the mom was in, you know, induced or her labor was augmented with oxytocin or pitocin, the, 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 it increases the chances that the mom is gonna have uterine acne. Huge risk. Women do not ever underestimate how quickly a woman can bleed out from a postpartum hemorrhage, all right? So what do we do for that? The first thing we do would be non-pharmacologic measures. And we've already talked about this in another class, I believe, but Fundal massage, we would try first, right? Before we start doing medications, we would try a fundal massage, all right? Um, and another medication that's brand new for um, postpartum hemorrhage that isn't even in your textbook yet is the transemic acid. And that's an antifibrinolytic, which you're not being tested on, but you may hear about when you're doing your um, OB rotations. And that's um, just this past like six months or so starting to be seen around in Rhode Island. And what that does is it prevents mom's clots from breaking down. So it helps them, um, it helps uh, prevent when we have a serious postpartum hemorrhage. Okay, but that's not on your test. All right, so we're going to also relieve pain from uterine contractions. 
That uterus, as it shrinks down on itself to stop its own bleeding, hurts. It's crampy. It's an uncomfortable feeling. Perineal wounds, which depending on the patient, you can have a minor tear that's, you know, nothing a woman doesn't even think about. And you're going to have something as severe as a fourth degree lack, which believe me, they need some major pain medication for it really does hurt. Um, and hemorrhoids. Never dismiss something that is, you know, oh, of course you had hemorrhoids. You pushed for three hours. No, those hurt. And if we can do something to alleviate that discomfort, of course we should do that. We want to promote bowel function, especially in our C-section patients. Um, also, our vaginal delivery, even though they're not a surgical patient, the, the uh, localized swelling and trauma from childbirth often makes women constipated because of the fear of pushing. They have uh, an episiotomy or a laceration, and now um, it's in such close proximity to um, the rectum that they're afraid of pushing, and so a lot of women do end up constipated. We want to enhance their immunity. So what do we want to do is, um, in many cases, we will look to see if mom is deficient in any immunizations, and we want to make sure that we capture that and um, provide any routine immunizations. Uh, uh, many cases, women, you know, sort of fall off the um, primary care um, radar after they've delivered a baby. So while they're in their reproductive years, they're constantly being seen by physicians um, for specialized issues, but the routine stuff that we should make sure they have, like immunizations, aren't always at the forefront. So we make sure, to, is their MMR up to date? You know, are they immune to rubella? Um, which we'll go over in a later slide. Um, do they need a flu shot? Do, you know, anything. Um, we also like to cocoon families. Um, newborns aren't going to be immune to many of the things that we are and um, so we will capture those families and make sure dad mom any grandparents are going to be taking care of the newborn we like to make sure that they have um, especially their pertussis vaccine up to date okay and we want to maintain safe lactation do we um, want mom to resume a medication that could potentially be passed through the breast milk to the infant, or do we want to make sure we want to make sure mom's not taking any medications that could um, hurt lactation or prevent milk flow? Okay, all right. So prevention of uterinary. We did go over this in the. Um, the labor medications. So oxytocin is a natural, um, comes from your, um, oh, of course my brain's not working right now. Um, anyway, it's a natural enzyme. And so when um, women breastfeed, oxytocin is released and it causes uterine cramping. And that's a natural defense so that you don't bleed to death. First things we do are non-pharmacologic. So if we have increased bleeding in a postpartum mom, we're gonna do fundal massage and we're gonna have her empty her bladder. The bladder sits right next to the uterus and if it's over full or even halfway full, it can impair the ability of the uterus to contract, okay? So um, also oxytocin post-delivery. A lot of facilities, including women and infants, have an oxytocin protocol for postpartum patients. So they get a set dose of oxytocin for several hours after delivery to help that uterus firm up and to prevent bleeding. Okay, So um, reliefing of uterine cramping and perineal pain in a vaginal delivery, um, acetaminophen and um, codeine or T3s, um, we have to keep in mind that the maximum dose for acetaminophen is three grams. So even if they're not getting the codeine component, a lot of women will be prescribed regular Tylenol, okay? Or they may be prescribed T3s, which is acetaminophen and codeine while they're inpatient. And then for discharge, they're given Tylenol. Make sure that you provide, most of these patients are not medical, like they don't have a lot of medical knowledge and they need to be reminded that the maximum dose is three grams. So that, you know, I've had moms go home and they're taking their Tylenol and then, you know, maybe they wanna get some sleep and they go to take some NyQuil, which also has Tylenol in it. And you could be at huge risk for um, acetaminophen overdose. Ibuprofen, our friend ibuprofen. So usually it's a 800 milligram dose 
but it can be anywhere from 200 to 800 milligrams based on the patient. Same thing applies every time we talk about ibuprofen, it impairs protection. So um, yes, it's great for that swelling, perineal swelling, and it also helps with the uterine cramping pain, but we're gonna use that with precautions in patients with known um, gastric issues. And we would always wanna uh, make sure that we screen patients for that, okay? Topical and local agents for perineal pain. Witch hazel pads. Woohoo! It's like a dollar a bottle. Um, or you can get the tux pads. If uh, patients are going home with a, um, you know, if uh, they need to be soaking their perineal area, if they have like a, a fourth degree lack, um, we often will say, you know, pick up a bottle of witch hazel at CVS or Rite Aid on your way home. And that way, um, when you do your sitz bath, you can add a little bit of that and it really does soothe the area. Or they can just stick with the witch hazel pads like the tux pads. Um, some women like those, um, I've had patients now that buy the yellow packets of the hemorrhoid preparation, which is the same thing, those preparation H yellow sheets. And they like those better because they can kind of wrap it around the pad. Whatever the patient prefers, it's witch hazel, okay? Um, hemorrhoid creams with hydrocortisone. Again, we're looking at inflammation from the trauma of birth and that whole area gets swollen. Um, benzocaine sprays like Dermaplast, um, most inpatients will be, you know, give in a can of that. Please be very careful um, when spraying that, not to do that too near where they can inhale that. It's just um, a safety precaution. You can buy Dermaplast over the counter as well. So if the patient runs out, you can let them know. Um, usually they don't prescribe that, but you can buy it at CVS or Rite Aid, okay? An ice pack. Ooh, ice, ice the first 24 hours. Remember, ice the first 24 and then warmth, okay? So that vaginal delivery comes out with a third degree laceration or a gigantic episiotomy. Ice, 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 ice. Only 20 minutes at a time, okay? We don't want to overdo our cold therapy, but 20 minutes on, um, then repeat in like another half hour, that's totally fine. And they have those, um, most hospitals, with postpartum patients will have those gigantic peri pads with the ice built in. If they don't, you can do um, regular ice packs, but make sure you wrap them because those can be a little bit too cold. Or I've seen nurses fill up gloves with ice, so forth. And then sits baths. A cold sits bath the first day, warm sits bath after that. And what's nice about a sits bath, we don't want women sitting in a pool of water. So no baths, okay? But we want, what's nice about a sits bath is the water circulates. That's what the bag is for, so that they're not sitting in bacteria. That's why we don't say go home and sit in a bathtub, because they're gonna sit in with all their bacteria and they're gonna get an infection. A sits bath is different. The water's running, which is the whole point, okay? And remind patients not to douche um, as much as they may want to, because that increases the risk of infection. Okay, relief of C-section pain. C-sections are major abdominal surgery. They need opiates. So the, the one thing that um, is very common, but we had a shortage of it for a little while, is morphine added to the spinal anesthesia, which is called a duramorph. So they give a long-acting morphine in with the spinal so that once the, um, the lidocaine wears off, they can move around, but the morphine sticks around for the first day provides great pain relief women um, that it works for, it works very, very well. Unfortunately, the biggest side effect is we know morphine can not cause an allergic reaction, but it can kick histamine out and make patients itchy. Not a true allergy, but it is a side effect that patients with morphine or other opiates, especially morphine, can have itch associated with this. Now we have a long-acting morphine product on board that lasts for 24 hours. So if they have the severe itch, it lasts for the full 24 hours and then we're giving them Benadryl. I've seen patients should be like, you know, I would have preferred the incisional pain over this generalized itch. It's driving me crazy. Um, and we try all types of things. We give them Benadryl. Sometimes we give them ice packs. Um, anecdotally, I've had patients use Vicks Vapor Rub with some good effect, but that's, you know, off off label, okay? Um, or we can give them a, a PCA. So morphine or hydromorphone are the most commonly used, okay? After the, that's usually the first day, all right? You had a baby, 
Um, you need to be awake to take care of your baby. You need to get up and walk around. So after the first 24 hours, or sometimes some, you know, within the first 18, they're switched to opiates, um, PO opiates, so things uh, plus an NSAID. So most patients will be um, prescribed something like Percocet or Vicodin plus ibuprofen. Um, or they can um, be prescribed just the oxycodone instead of the acetaminophen and oxycodone if they have a, a Tylenol sensitivity or so forth. Just because someone is on a routine prescription, so a lot of um, patients on a postpartum floor are kind of treated like cookie cutter patients. If you have a patient who has like a complicated surgical history or they've used opiates in the past, the routine prescriptions may not be enough. You need to listen to your patients. Now, I'm not advocating that you knock everybody out, but just because they had two Percocets and they had 800 milligrams of ibuprofen does not always mean that their pain is going to be managed. Sometimes we have to advocate and get an additional dose of just the oxycodone or something a little bit stronger if the patient's history and their assessment warrants it, all right? I had a patient once that had had um, multiple surgeries on her spine, had been on opiates for years, and they thought that the routine uh, two Percocet was gonna cover her pain and absolutely did not. She needed a much higher dose to manage her pain. We don't want mom sobbing in the bed, unable to take care of her baby. We wanna advocate for her. Okay, promoting bowel function. This is, we do this for everybody. Walk, 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 walk. Even our C-sections, get out of bed, walk around. It prevents so many other things. You know that DVT, uh, you know, prevents um, lots of stuff. Okay, drinking plenty of fluids if tolerated. Not everybody, no. Most women of childbearing age who have just had a baby are in relatively good health. Nowadays though, we do have some patients so if the patient has a history of heart disease or CHF, obviously we're gonna give them less fluids to begin with. Fiber in their diet, just like any other patient. Docusate sodium, so that's almost 100% of postpartum patients are placed on docusate sodium. Um, and if they're on opiates, we may not only do docusate sodium, but we may add another agent like Metamucil or milk of magnesia or things like that. What drugs are safe with lactation? How do we know? Okay, so if you're in a hospital that deals with newborns and moms all the time, you ask their clinical pharmacist, they will know. But there's also a, a website called LactMed and you can just go to the, um, and that's a gov, anything that ends in gov is from the federal government. So it's toxnet.nlm.nih.gov. So you can click on the, the link or you can actually Google LactMed. Um, does the medication get passed to the infant or does the medication affect lactation? Okay. Suppression of lactation, that's something we commonly talk about because we really are promoting breastfeeding, even if it's in the short term. Okay. There are medications to suppress lactation in moms not wishing to breastfeed or moms who can't breastfeed. If you're on a long term psych med and it's the only thing that keeps you. Um, stable, then of course we want you to have your psych med. Um, but now we primarily use non-pharmacologic measures. So we're going to do the opposite of what we would do to promote lactation. So to promote lactation, we would have the baby feed and simulation of the nipples and maybe using a breast pump and so forth. The opposite goes if we're suppressing lactation. So we would avoid, absolutely avoid any stimulation of the nipples. They're gonna be tightly wrapped with a good fitting bra and maybe a belly band kind of around their breasts. Um, we're gonna tell them don't take the bra off. Don't try to release any milk or you're gonna make it worse. And don't stimulate the nipples at any point, even in the shower, okay? All right. So. RH, okay. So if you, um, about 15% of the population is RH negative. That's that rhesus factor. So in addition to your regular blood type, A, B, O, A, B, you'll also be um, checking to see if the mom is RH negative. That's the only time we have to intervene, by the way, is if mom is RH negative. So if you get report and your mom is A positive, woohoo, you don't have to deal with it. When you get that report that mom is a negative, B negative, O negative, then we actually have to assess the type of the baby. Now it's an autosomal um, recessive gene. 
So if mom is negative and dad is negative, then if it's that's actually the daddy, then the baby will be negative too. Um, but we do check the baby's blood type. So they'll do a, st a heel stick, they'll check the baby's blood type. And they also wanna check mom, so they will do a um, Kleinhauer Becky, and they will see if how much of the baby's blood interacted with moms at the time of delivery. This varies. So for a full-term pregnancy, we have a set dose. If mom had a complicated delivery, excessive bleeding, uh, prolonged, you know, something complicated that happened during the delivery, there may have been more exposure to mom of the baby's blood, like a, an abruption and so forth. So sometimes mom will need a higher dose if it was a complicated delivery. If it's a routine delivery, mom gets a set dose, no problem. But they will draw the mom's blood and see how much exposure she had from the baby, okay? So if mom is uh, above 26 to 28 um, gestational weeks, she will get a dose of Rogam to prevent buildup of antibodies within her blood if the baby's blood has come in contact with hers at all, okay? So usually around seven months or so, mom will get a uh, preemptive shot of Rogam, which prevents her from building antibodies against her baby, okay? So it's um, human D immune globulin. So um, it's actually interesting how they, you, they used to get this. So um, what happened in the old days is your first baby, if you're an RH negative mom with an RH positive dad, the baby would be RH positive most likely, unless dad has uh, another family member. And the first baby usually wasn't affected. Mom would be sensitized either during the latter part of her pregnancy or at delivery. And then subsequent pregnancies, that's when you would have the issue. Mom's antibodies would attack the fetus. Um, and there were many, many families that this affected where subsequent children um, you know, would have uh, multiple IUFTs or premature deliveries or abortion, uh, spontaneous abortions or miscarriages. And it was a scourge. And then they figured out that women who had gone through this had antibodies for this human D immune globulin. Um, so they would screen moms who had had this happen to them. So the victims that had, this had happened to, and they built Rogam from it. Um, so what they would do is they would inject other mothers who are at risk for this and it would prevent them from developing the antibodies and that way they could have as many children as they wanted. It's a wonderful thing. It is based on blood donations, however. So every time you give blood, if you're um, you know, thinking about this, um, think about all the wonderful people um, so in the old days, it used to be victims of this in the past. They would be the ones that donated blood and then their immunoglobulin was given to other moms to prevent. They have a man that actually had received multiple blood transfusions. They call him the man with the golden arm. He lives in Australia and he's saved countless babies in Australia because his blood, um, they were, he was one of the first people they were able to make Rogium out of in Australia. Nowadays, they take, they take people who aren't negative and they give them a little bit of sensitivity and then they screen their blood so it's done a little bit differently but in the beginning it was victims who had ha who had lost children or had multiple miscarriages and they realized that they had been sensitized and they would screen their blood for this so um anyway so the only moms you have to worry about looking up at all and worry about this is rh negative if mom is rh negative you must check the baby's blood type if baby is negative all set, don't have to worry about it. If baby is RH positive, then we need to give Rogam. Okay. So we're gonna, mom's gonna be inoculated or get her Rogam shot around 26 to 28 weeks and then within the first few days after delivery. All right. Okay. Um, and the standard dose is 300 micrograms IM. All right. We also give this for fetal losses. So if mom loses, if an RH negative mom has a loss, there could be exposure and we want her to be able to have a healthy pregnancy later on. So we, you know, it's hard. You, you have a, a patient with a, like a 30 week IUFT who's lost an infant. And now we have to say, I'm really sorry, but we're going to have to give you a dose of Rogam. We're going to have to give you a big, a big shot um, so that this, you know, potentially doesn't happen again.
All right, so we're going to determine the infant's blood type through lab specimen, right? And if the again, if the baby's Rh negative, then mom's all set. Baby Rh positive, then mom gets drawn. It's called a Kleinhauer Becky or a fetal hemoglobin. And we want to see the number of cells circulating in mom's blood that don't belong to her, okay? And then the ROGAM gets delivered from, um, ordered through the blood bank. Remember, it's screened from other people. It gets done through the blood bank. And then mom is injected IM. All right, so here's the quick question. An RH uh, negative mom gives birth to an infant with RH negative blood type. The nurse understands, well, we just talked about that, that mom will not need ROGAM. So if they're both negative, woohoo, mom doesn't need another shot. I myself am RH negative and all four of my kids were RH positive. So I went through this uh, eight injections worth. Um, but I thank those people that came before me for their sacrifice and blood donations so that I was able to have four healthy kids. Okay, we give them a uh, patient identification card. So we've given them something that will affect the mom's antibodies. And um, sometimes it can impact mom's ability to donate anything other than red cells later on. I had antibodies for a little while. So we give mom, we do give mom a wallet card, okay? Um, and it says right on it, RH, um, anti-RH antibodies, also called anti-D, will be present in my blood for several weeks. So, you know, um, it doesn't disqualify the mom from getting any additional injections, um, but just so they're aware that mom will have those antibodies. Um, congenital rubella syndrome. So we know the MMR that everybody's supposed to get. Uh, Castle Branch, anybody? Um, doesn't always work for everybody. Not everybody seroconverts, like meaning that they don't always develop antibodies for what they should have. So um, if mom contracts rubella while she's pregnant um, and it occurs in you know the worst time while she's pregnant, they can have congenital rubella syndrome. There's no treatment. Um, so the goals are immunization and prevention. So what do we do? We do um, titers when moms are pregnant and we find out, ideally in a perfect world, we would be doing titers before women thought about getting pregnant, but we know that doesn't always happen. So we would check mom and if she is not rubella immune, first we warn mom, be very, very careful while you're pregnant. And two, you can't give it while they're pregnant. So you have to wait until after delivery. So as soon as mom delivers while she's still inpatient, unless there's some other contraindication, she will get inoculated with an MMR before she goes home to, prevent, to protect other pregnancies. Okay, it's not gonna prevent it, anything in that newborn, um, but it'll protect future pregnancies um, from the risk of congenital rubella syndrome, all right? 